Elijah Fish was a footnote in the stories told about his brother Emery. He was the brother who had to sit on the jury that convicted Emery of murder. The brother who lived in the area. The brother who monetarily supported Emery during his imprisonment, etc. But now it's the time for Elijah to step out from the shadows and to be recognized for his own incredible life and accomplishments helping those fleeing from injustice. While Emery is remembered primarily for taking lives, Elijah did what he could to help improve the lives of untold numbers of strangers. This is Birmingham Uncovered, a podcast by the Birmingham Museum, where we are exploring the diverse and compelling lives that built Birmingham, Michigan into the community that it is today. First, some background on Birmingham. We are a city of approximately 20,000 people, over 4.73 square miles, approximately halfway between Detroit and Pontiac in Oakland County. This area was occupied by members of the Three Fires Confederacy of Indigenous People before white settlement in the area started in the late 18-teens. Birmingham became a city in 1933 and today is known as a prosperous and multifaceted community with a thriving cultural scene. This episode, we are returning to that early settlement to look at the life of Elijah Fish, the younger brother of Emery, the subject of our last episode, and to take a look at early religious life in the settlement and what anti-slavery activism looked like in Oakland County before the Civil War. A quick note on sources for this episode, much of the account of Elijah's early life and movements come from an account written by his grandson, Lucian Fish and preserved by Elijah's great-great-grandson, Jerry Fish, who has written a history of the Fish family. Later, abolitionist activities are pieced together from the family history, as well as taken from primary sources, like newspaper accounts. Just a quick note on language before we continue on. Our language conventions, when talking about the institution of slavery and the people held in bondage in such a system, are changing. And that's for the better. We here at the museum use the word enslaved or held in bondage instead of slave. Using the adjective enslaved instead of the noun slave shows that the person was subjected to the situation of enslavement as an act by another, rather than being an object that can be owned. Using held in bondage retains a person's humanity while pointing out the position into which they were forced. We use the phrase enslaver instead of slave owner or master. Using the word enslaver emphasizes the action of one person forcing servitude upon another person without reinforcing any suggestion that owning another person is possible or real. We use the phrase freedom seeker instead of fugitive. The word fugitive implies that the person was acting against society and that they were unlawful. It also suggests that enslavers were acting legally and appropriately. By using freedom seeker, the emphasis is on the intent and actions of the person seeking his or her rights to freedom. Lastly, we use the phrase self-emancipation. This word gives agency to the person who decided to face extreme dangers to free themselves from bondage. However, we do maintain the original language when quoting from historical sources. Elijah was the sixth and last child born to Josiah Fish and Elizabeth Hazelton Fish in Athol, Massachusetts, in 1791. When he was very young, the family moved to Allen's Mill, which is now located within the city limits of Rochester, New York, but at that time was a wilderness area that was crossed by travelers looking to settle further west. By the time the Fish family moved to it, the mill had fallen into disrepair, and travelers commented on the cramped, primitive, and often flooded living conditions. In 1798, when Elijah was seven, his mother died of malaria, sometimes called ague in historical records. It was a disease which an older brother remembered everyone in the family getting at one point or another. In the late 1700s, Mainstream American society didn't see men as the sort of nurturing beings who were suited to caring for young children. 
And to add to that, in such a harsh environment, a seven-year-old child who couldn't do the tasks that his older siblings could do was seen as more of a burden than a help. So Elijah was sent to live with an aunt and uncle in Vermont. According to a family history written in 1937 by his grandson Lucien, Elijah recalled very little of his life in New York, but he did recall that, upon setting out for the long journey on horseback to Vermont, he didn't have a suitable hat to wear to protect him from the harsh sun. So he made do with a woman's old silk hat until another could be procured in the nearest town. He gave the silk hat to an old woman he met, who mentioned that she had a grandson who needed another form of headgear. Elijah spent the next 11 years in Vermont with his aunt's family as the only boy and only young child. All of his female cousins were older than him, and many were already out of the house. His grandmother, Hazelton, was a member of the household, and one of his tasks was to help keep her warm during the cold nights by heating up a brass warming pan for her bed and to accompany her around to the homes of his aunts and uncles in the neighborhood. As opposed to his brother's lives in New York, Elijah never went hungry. True, some of the food was a bit plain, but he always had enough of it. He also had the opportunity to attend school, which he really didn't utilize, a fact that he would come to regret when he was older. At 18, he and a friend went looking for work in Boston. No lasting career was found, but he did return home with some money in his pocket and the absolute height in men's fashion at the time. White topped boots. Picture those knee-high riding boots with the band of brown on the upper calf, and then replace the brown with white, and you tell me that's not the height of style. Due to the distance between New York and Vermont, Elijah hadn't seen his father for most of his childhood, and decided to go for a visit. But it being the War of 1812, he got pulled into the fight, getting employment as a teamster in the army and serving in the Battle of Chippewa Falls. If you're anything like me, your history class only briefly touched on the War of 1812 as sort of a midway point between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. Part of that is even though the War of 1812 gave us an important touchpoint in our national identity, the Star-Spangled Banner, the war itself is a bit of a convoluted mess. I'm going to try my best to explain it as succinctly as I can. It partly grew out of one of the many wars between France and Britain at this time, and this particular one dealt with Napoleon. And I know that really doesn't narrow it down much, but it was the first rise of the first Napoleon. Britain and France wanted the United States to cut off the other, and the United States refused. Britain then started impressing American ships and their crews to help in their own war effort. In the Great Lakes area, though, it was all about westward expansion and controlling the lucrative fur trade. Though places like what would one day become Michigan were ceded to the newly formed United States after the Revolutionary War in the 1783 Treaty of Versailles, Britain still controlled most of the fur trade that was happening within the territory. As we touched on in Emery Fish's episode, many Native American groups that were living in lands claimed by the United States allied themselves with the British. There are many different reasons for this. Some sided with Great Britain because they promised that if they won, they would stop settlement west of the Appalachians. Some because Britain just seemed like the lesser of two evils. And some tried to remain neutral. The British also sought to destabilize the growing U.S. economy by offering freedom to enslaved people who joined the war effort on their side. Historians estimate that around 4,000 formerly enslaved people from the United States found freedom in British Canada during the War of 1812. This was the largest single group emancipation prior to the American Civil War. Descendants of the Black Refugees, as they are known, still live in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Trinidad, where their ancestors were settled by Britain. We simply don't know what Elijah Fish's opinion on this was, 
how did this future abolitionist feel about fighting for the side that was, in part, seeking to keep the enslaved enslaved? As the Star-Spangled Banner, written by Francis Scott Key, put it in 1814, quote, No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or gloom of the grave, and the Star-Spangled Banner in triumph doth wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave, end quote. But any staunch abolitionist knew that Britain was hardly a utopia where slavery didn't exist. The transatlantic trade of enslaved humans from Africa had only been abolished in Britain in 1807, and significantly didn't outlaw the institution from continuing in its overseas colonies. Slavery continued in British colonies until 1838. We simply don't have enough information on when Elijah Fish came into his abolitionist ideals, or how he might have wrestled with the nuances of the time, or even if he was aware of all the nuances at the time. Fighting took place on land in the United States and what is now Canada, then a British colony. Battles also took place on the Atlantic Ocean and in the Great Lakes. The Battle of Chippewa Falls, where Elijah Fish saw action as a teamster, took place in the British colony of Upper Canada, along the Niagara River, in what is today the province of Ontario. It began on July 5, 1814, with an invasion of American forces. This battle, along with the Battle of Lundy's Lane, showed that American troops could hold their own against the British Army. The Battle of Chippewa Falls was a victory for the American side. And what was Elijah doing during the battle? A teamster during the War of 1812 was an enlisted person in charge of driving a team of animals that were pulling wagons full of supplies that were vital to keep armies fed, clothed, and outfitted. Today, many will be familiar with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, a union formed in 1903 that at first represented only horse-driving teams and stable hands, but they now represent a wide variety of professions, including truck drivers, healthcare workers, brewers, pilots, secretaries, and even zookeepers. The War of 1812 concluded officially in February of 1815, and the outcome was, well, much remained the same. Neither the U.S. or Britain gained or lost any territory. And if you are ever bored, jump online and ask a group of history enthusiasts who won the War of 1812. A heated debate will ensue. I was once in a Facebook group that had to ban all discussions of the war because of the fights. It was glorious. It does bear mentioning, though, that Britain did compensate the United States for the formerly enslaved people who had sought freedom on British soil. The formerly enslaved folks themselves never received compensation for their forced labor, nor would any emancipated folks in the future. Between the War of 1812 and the American Civil War, which would begin in 1861, 10,000 to 30,000 freedom seekers settled in Canada and some of those were helped by Elijah Fish. But before that, in the winter of 1814, Elijah was in Ogden, New York, where he met Fanny Spencer. His grandson wrote that, for the sleigh rides and other amusements his group of acquaintances undertook, that the young men would decide in advance who would accompany which young lady. And even though Elijah wanted very much to go with Fanny, he always held back in the decision-making and then would offer his arm to whichever young lady was not spoken for. Lucian makes it sound like this was a testament to Elijah's character, but the modern reader is left asking why no one just asked Fanny who she would like to sit next to on the sleigh ride. Elijah and Fanny married on October 22nd, 1825, and they settled in Black Rock, New York. This shaped trajectory for the rest of their lives. At the conclusion of the War of 1812, the United States' government realized that it was in their best interest to encourage settlement in the Midwest quickly 
During the war, the British took the fort of Detroit without a single shot being fired, due in part to the lack of available reinforcements on the American side. New technology made this expansion even quicker and more convenient. Whereas an overland route from New York to the Michigan Territory took upwards of about five weeks, taking a steamship through the Great Lakes could have that time. The first steamship of this sort, the Walk on the Water, was built in Black Rock and left on its maiden voyage in May 1818. Perhaps inspired by seeing the ship and maybe bitten by the same bug that caused his father to take his own family westward, Elijah took his wife and two children on a voyage west to Detroit. They missed taking the walk on the water, though, and instead took a schooner and made their way into what is now Birmingham in 1820. We talked a bit about what settlement in the area looked like in our last episode about Elijah's brother, Emery, and the murders of Polly and Cynthia Utter in 1825. But suffice to say, the Fishes were among the first half-dozen families to find a home in the wilderness of Bloomfield Township along the Saginaw Trail, today known as Woodward Avenue. During the early years of their marriage in New York, both Elijah and Fanny joined the Presbyterian Church and held the first Presbyterian Church services in the settlement in 1834 in their barn. Christian churches, including the Presbyterian Church, had been struggling with the question of slavery throughout the 1700s and 1800s. In 1818, the Presbyterian General Assembly adopted a resolution that declared enslavement a gross violation that was inconsistent with the law of God. Parts of the denomination took this language and ran with it, becoming radical abolitionists, while other parts tried to fly a middle or more neutral path in order not to offend members of the church who were enslavers. Did Elijah come to the Presbyterian Church because he held anti-slavery ideals? Did the church influence him? Did the family of his brother-in-law, Elijah Giddings, who was married to Elijah's older sister, Philotheta, who were well-known abolitionists, influence him? Again, we don't know. But in 1836, Elijah helped found the Oakland County Anti-Slavery Society with George Wisner, Nathan Power, John P. Leroy, and several others. In June, Elijah published several notices in the Pontiac Courier looking for delegates to go to Ann Arbor for the Michigan Anti-Slavery Meeting, listing him as vice president in the notice. Abolitionists in Oakland County were members of many Christian denominations, including folks from other Presbyterian churches. Deacon Fish, as he was now known, was in good company. From here on out, we are primarily tracking his activities via newspaper notices. His family does note with pride that, quote, he had a keen sense of humor and enjoyed a joke, even at his own expense, perpetrated by the other fellow. Perhaps to this appreciation and a hearty recognition of the other fellow, he owed some of his popularity. Indeed, the other fellow, whether he was the Negro slave toiling at his unrequited task, the red man being crowded off his hunting ground, the drunkard struggling with his growing appetite, his wife bearing the burdens that come to such lives, or the poor widow trying to bring up her little brood respectably occupied a large space in the thoughts and sympathies of Elijah S. Fish. End quote. During the 1840s, Elijah was very active in the anti-slavery and abolitionist movements, as evidenced by several mentions of his work in The Signal of Liberty, an abolitionist newspaper published in Ann Arbor. Elijah continued as chairman for the Oakland County Anti-Slavery Society and participated on committees to support candidates for election to local and state governments. He worked with well-known abolitionists of the time, including Nathan Powers of Farmington and George Wisner of Pontiac. In 1845, Elijah was one of the 12 delegates to represent Oakland County at the Michigan State Anti-Slavery Society meeting in Marshall, Michigan. The Underground Railroad isn't a railroad. But it's a term that folks today, and at the time, applied to a network of people that helped freedom seekers with food, clothing, 
shelter, and transportation. It's important to stress here that this network could be flexible. Roots, safe houses, and the folks who helped weren't set in stone. The 1850s marked a turning point in the abolitionist movement in the United States. The 1850 Fugitive Slave Act was the first of such acts to actually have teeth, making it a crime to assist folks seeking freedom and allowing bounty hunters to arrest individuals even in northern free states. All these bounty hunters needed was an affidavit from an enslaver stating that they, quote, owned the individual for that person to be dragged back into enslavement. Oakland County suddenly became a much more significant location on the Underground Railroad network. Bounty hunters were thick on the ground in Detroit, a significant spot for freedom seekers to cross from the United States into Canada. It was increasingly dangerous for freedom seekers to spend time in Detroit. Many now paused somewhere in Oakland County until the coast was clear to move right through Detroit and over into Canada or at the crossing at Port Huron. Locations like Birmingham and Royal Oak were in a great position here, being situated right on Woodward Avenue, the main thoroughfare to and through Detroit. Stories abound of freedom seekers hidden under false bottoms of a farm wagon, taking produce into Detroit market. This meant that freedom seekers could no longer count on freedom upon reaching the border of a free state, but instead had to travel onto Canada in order to fully attain their freedom. And the abolitionists who helped along the way had to be even more careful about their activities, lest they risk the attention of bounty hunters who would stake out their home or businesses in the hopes of capturing freedom seekers, or end up in prison. The punishment for assisting freedom seekers was $1,000 and up to six months in jail. Some freedom seekers chose to stay in Canada once they arrived, and there were several prominent abolitionists and formerly enslaved people who helped them acquire the education and work that allowed them to live their free lives to the fullest. One such person was Henry Bibb, who self-emancipated in 1837. Bibb wrote an autobiography called Narrative on the Life and Adventures of Henry Bibb, which gives an account of his life during enslavement and escape. He toured Michigan on speaking tours and visited Birmingham on August 19, 1846. Bibb also published The Voice of the Fugitive, a newspaper in Canada that brought news of the abolitionist movement and advice for those seeking freedom. Bibb was one of the founders of the Refugee Home Society, an organization that helped purchase land in Canada for those escaping enslavement and wanting to start their new life of freedom. Elijah Fish was elected president of the society in 1851. In several issues in The Voice of the Fugitive, Elijah Fish is mentioned by name and thanked for donating money and goods to the Refugee Home Society. In March of 1851, the paper printed, quote, We would also thankfully acknowledge a small lot of clothing and provisions which H. Bibb, or Henry Bibb, received from the hands of Deacon E. Fish of Birmingham, Oakland County, collected by him from the Friends of Humanity for the same object in that town. End quote. In the village of Birmingham, Elijah was the voice of the Friends of Liberty in Birmingham, a group of local citizens involved in the abolition movement. The Friends were responsible for setting up lectures by prominent abolitionists, including Henry Bibb and William Cooper Nell, a well-known abolitionist from Boston. The Friends also held at least one Liberty Convention in Birmingham, at the Mechanics Hall in 1844. In the 1840s and 1850s, public talks and lectures were a big source of entertainment, especially in a small village like Birmingham. Henry Bibb and William Cooper Nell were celebrities of the traveling lecture circuit. Future Birmingham mover and shaker, Martha Baldwin, wrote in her diary about attending such talks and the excitement they could produce. For many, hearing first-hand accounts of the horrors of slavery from those like Bibb, who had been enslaved, galvanized them into abolitionist action. 
While working tirelessly for abolition, Elijah was busy. He was deacon at the First Presbyterian Church and a father to seven children. Though he shared that same urge to go westward with his father, he appears to have been better equipped to provide materially for his family. In 1888, Elijah and Fanny's daughter, also called Fanny, there had been another daughter named Fanny who died a few years before this Fanny was born. Recycling names like this was super common at the time, and I cannot begin to describe how confusing this is for historians. But Fanny wrote an article for the Oakland County Pioneer Society in which she reminisced about Birmingham's early days. She writes warmly about the small, snug cabin of hewn logs her father built. Instead of the flea and mosquito-infested rooms without a fireplace that her father had spent several years in growing up in the New York frontier, Fanny mentions an actual wooden floor and handmade shelves lining the walls. When the roof leaked, Elijah quickly set to work to fix it. Towards the end of his life, the tide was turning against slavery in the United States leading up to the Civil War. Sadly, Elijah never saw the passage of the 13th Amendment and the end of slavery in the United States. He died on February 28, 1861, at the age of 70, only a few months before Confederate forces fired on Fort Sumter. Several of his sons carried on his work, first in Kansas, where they had breakfast with John Brown, and later in the Union Army. His daughter, Fanny Fish Irving Trollope, inherited Elijah's adventuring spirit, going to California and Mexico while making several scientific discoveries before returning to her hometown and settling down a bit. We'll explore her story later in another podcast. Elijah Fish's life is a great snapshot of American life in the early to mid-1800s. War, westward expansion, technological improvements, debates about religion, personhood, and slavery. His life also illustrates that although the Birmingham he lived in was a small village, the residents were involved in national debates and national movements. Because of his involvement with the Underground Railroad, in 2022, Elijah Fish's grave site in Birmingham's Greenwood Cemetery was added to the National Park Service's National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom, a program that recognizes both the freedom seekers who traveled along the Underground Railroad and the abolitionists who assisted them. I thought about closing out this episode with Elijah's epitaph, which reads, quote, A useful life and peaceful death is the epitome of his history, end quote. Which, sure, yeah, that describes him. But why not use a quote that was actually said by him during his 25-year-long public quest to end the enslavement of other human beings? As president of the Oakland County Anti-Slavery Society, he was quoted by the Signal of Liberty as saying, quote, that slavery is a sin against God and the violation of human rights, subversive to the gospel, end quote. I'm Caitlin Donnelly, and thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Birmingham Uncovered. Special thanks to the Birmingham Area Cable Board for PEG grant funding that made this podcast possible. Also, thanks to past and present staff of the Birmingham Museum, in particular, Leslie Pilak and Donna Cassicelli, who have been hard at work identifying members and participants of Oakland County's Underground Railroad Network. Join us next time for a look at the life of one of Birmingham's, quote, founders, who has a lot of things around town named after him for a guy who maybe once set foot on Birmingham soil.